had this place 26 years, and all along, uh, there are little places that sort of resonate with memory. Like right here in this little mossy area, I used to come and just sit there and meditate and read. And, or, you know, this little bluff here. It, it's, it's funny, it doesn't look that tall. But when you get up in that little knob, the whole perspective of the lake shifts. And you look across at our lake, and you know, and, I mean, we've cut the trails all up and through here. And, there's something about knowing a piece of ground. I mean, there's no, none of these areas we haven't walked in that. And, um. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I was born in Vancouver, but I was raised in a, outside of Montreal. And it, that experience in Montreal had a, a very big impact on me because I think it's how I became an anthropologist because it was at a time when, of course, two solitudes in the 50s when I was a little boy and the French didn't speak to the English and vice versa and there was one boulevard that ran down the kind of the middle of our neighborhood dividing the two worlds and I used to be sent there by my mother uh, to get groceries or you know and cigarettes whatever she wanted and it was an old French couple owned it and I would sit there they were very friendly with me and I'd look across this boulevard to another world a different religion, a different language, a different way of being, a different way of carrying yourself, a different sense of family. And I became really intrigued by that, and intrigued not just by um, its reality, but by the subtle prohibition from my world that I wasn't allowed to cross into that world. Uh, not from my personal family, but from my society. And, you know, crossing those barriers between cultures has been all I've ever done all my life as a result. But when I went back to that community um, many years later, I was really haunted by a visceral kind of uh, connection to it. I mean, every blade of grass in that sort of 10, 15 block radius of, that had been my world as a child resonated with, with memory. Uh, shadows marked the ground where trees had fallen in my absence. Any new construction, I took a, something uh, as a personal affront, a violation of something that lay on the edge of memory, landscape, and myth. You know, quarries where we had um, hunted toads on summer days were now filled in with dreadful subdivisions. The, the cliff face where I used to look out over the St. Lawrence to the south, you know, is now covered with houses, I mean, uh, and I think uh, I, I, it was also very um, significant to grow up, I mean, even though we were in the English community, it was plunked like a carbuncle on the back of a very old Francophone village that dated to at least the 17th century, Point Claire, and um, uh, which, of course, was on Lake St. Louis, which was an imagination of the St. Lawrence. So I grew up on the edge of the St. Lawrence. And my heroes, growing up, without doubt, were the Coeur de Bois, who broke open the continent. And as at the youngest age, I could name the entire route across Canada. Uh, and I remember, at the age of 11, going to a canoe camp in northern Quebec. And my uh, counselor had been mauled by a bear, and he had these incredible scars on his thighs and he always wore shorts and I'd look at those scars and I just want to know what that moment had been like you know so it, it had a huge impact and, you know by winter we would um, play hockey on, on the St. Lawrence when it was frozen and set up our nets literally miles apart and just skate like the wind you know and, 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 and you know, in the summer we'd follow the rivers up by canoes so it was kind of a even though you grew up in Montreal of course perfect because Montreal was the heart of that whole fur trade. So, you know, if, if Americans look west for heroes, we look north. And uh, if they, you know, celebrated cowboys on the frontier, we celebrated fur traders in the woods. And, I, you know, everything I ever wanted to do was to be in the woods, like a, you know, that's all I ever wanted. I mean, I had that dream when I was five years old that a little boy ran off a river or a lake and in the arms of an old man at a fishing lodge somewhere and here I am, I've got the lodge, got the canoe, just don't have the grandson yet. Yeah, I'm working on it, I've got two daughters, hopefully before too long.
a satellite phone now um, to the internet, and I talked to my youngest daughter the other day in California, and you know, she's living her life at Stanford and so on. But the minute she hears a word, Yalui or Yilu, she just her, you can just hear her body melt. You know, she just longs to be here. You know, we, we were able to give the girls a wonderful exposure to all of this. You know, to, you know every, every year we, I didn't even set out to do this. It was just circumstantial, but it became kind of institutionalized as, as family habit. And the minute school was out, no matter what else was going on in my life, only very occasionally, I mean, I think once we missed part of the season because Raina, the youngest daughter, was literally born in, June, in late June. And we uh, we missed uh, one other time. I was one time we missed part of August because we, we were sailing across the Pacific, and I had to make some films. But basically, every year we've had at least once we were down to almost as little as a month up here. But generally, it's been two to three months since the kids were born, and they were born. I mean, Tara was conceived up here. The first season, Gail came up, and uh, then she was born the next year. And when she was uh, she was born in June, we had July. I remember we had July Fourth in Vancouver, but by the third week of July, we were in the Spatsizi. You know, this little girl was three or four weeks old, and she was already on a float plane going into. A, you know, 140 miles from the nearest road. <laughs>